Excellent. Welcome to the Knife Life, everybody. My name's James Allen. Today is the first live stream for the Knife Life, and we're gonna be talking about the Italian Storta short sword. And to do that today, I have Benaya Anderson with me. If I can actually- Hello, everyone. There we go. Um, Benaya, for those who don't know him, is a cutler. So what that is, is a person who ends up working on pre-made blades and furbishing them to end up being um, finished blades. So the guards, the grips, the pommels, anything like that ends up um, being done by the cutler. So that was, um, that's Benaya's specialty. That's what he ends up doing. And as a result of that, he gets to be involved with a lot of very interesting projects and ends up doing a lot of research into uh, antique historic blades. And so that's why I've brought Benaya on today. So how are you doing today, Benaya? Doing very well, James. Good to see you again. Excellent. So today we're talking about the Storta. Can you tell us exactly what the Storta actually is? Well, I'm not sure if I can tell you exactly what it is, but um, it's it's a really interesting um, sort of a side niche weapon in the uh, the European tradition. So um, I've got a few examples of pieces that are indicative of the type. Um, it has a lot of variety. Um, it's it's a generally single edged weapon. See if I can get things to slide along here. Often called a cutlass or um, falchion, things like that. Falchion tends to be an earlier weapon. And so the name applies to weapons that are from the age of mail, chain mail. So 1200s, 1300s. And generally that sword is a fairly wide bladed cutting weapon designed to have forward weight so that you can have the opportunity to break collarbones or break forearms dealing with that chainmail armor that would have been typical during the day. The Storta is coming around uh, a later time period and you, you see it frequently in early Renaissance art all the way through into the, the 16th century, the 17th century. It is a wide blade generally single-edged, sometimes with a back edge or a, a clipped point like, like this one here. Get myself on the camera. And what I enjoy the most about the Storta is that to me it seems very much like a weapon born out of the imagination of European sword makers of the day. In art, it is often depicted in foreign or ancient contexts because uh, the art of the day, the Renaissance, is coming out of Italy. And Italy is a multicultural, uh, large uh, marketplace for a lot of the activity that's going on in Asia is coming up through the Silk Road and uh, Spice Road and all of that stuff. So Italy has a lot of exposure to cultures from Africa, North Africa, from the steppes and things like that, that um, give them a different exposure to weaponry, styles, fashion. And the Storta is frequently associated in art specifically with uh, ancient or foreign types of weaponry. So if you ever want to illustrate Romans, for example, Roman soldiers are frequently illustrated wearing full Renaissance armor, but with foreign looking touches. And, and some of the things that they do to make them look foreign or ancient is give them a weapon that's different from the standard straight European long sword or cutting riding sword. So, so they give them a wide curved blade. So let's go ahead and pull up some of the art here that you sent me to um, look at and really to illustrate that case. So this is one example, if I remember, if I believe correctly, um, of okay. Renaissance kind of art of the time. So this is right. um, a classic 
scene. I forget which one this exact which one this, this is. This is David. Uh, this David beheading Goliath. Quite a few of the imagery that I found uh, from this specific uh, biblical incident shows David wielding Goliath's sword, which is in the illustrations a storta, um, a wide, single-edged cutting blade. You might think of it like a, a European imagination of a description of a third party talking about a scimitar or something like that, a shamshir, right? Speaking about a weapon from another culture and a different part of the world. And so how do you make the Philistines like Goliath seem different or foreign? You give them a different looking weapon. Yeah. Well, of course, these weapons were also very practical, very useful. And uh, if you're fighting someone who's not wearing a lot of armor, a wide curved blade makes a lot of sense. So it becomes something that the the Europeans take to very readily. Um, the modern, I guess, the modern using of the word falchion is kind of a broad umbrella to describe quite a few single-edged blades at the time. I don't think helps us quite as much when you're talking about the storta. Um, someone told me early on, uh, and I had to check for myself that storta meant short, and that's. Kind of what I went on until I looked it up for myself, and I found that um, storta from the Italian, at least modern Italian, means twisting or wrenching. It's much more like an action that is done rather than a description of the type of weapon. So I think that I may be wrong, I'm not a language historian, but that storta, the term, talks about how it's used not necessarily a description of the piece itself. Wrenching and twisting would be familiar if you are a student at all of Messer terminology. So if you've studied any of the German Messer fight manuals, there's a lot of winding. The, the German use of this false edge, true edge, false edge, winden, right? And, and if you use that same terminology, that idea that winding, wrenching, twisting, think that we can look at the Storta as a very similar type of weapon to the Messer, but separate from it. Yeah, so a lot of the blades um, from Germany that fall under kind of like the Le Kuchner, uh school of swordplay are kind of based upon the motions that you are talking about. Um, and it's really interesting that this is also applying into the Italian kind of Storta sword. Um, mm -hmm. And it looks like you actually have a messer there in order to compare against. Right. I wanted, I wanted to show the, the differences between them, and I, I had this as an example of what a storta isn't. A storta is not a messer, and you've got this long hand and a half, I suppose, grip. This is a fairly curved example. A lot of messer are fairly straight, and, and some storta are straight as well but they have a, a wide single edged blade. And so it just totally makes sense that the way they would be used is very similar. Um, having studied German and Italian swordsmanship, primarily Italian, I'm always struck by the arguments over stylistic differences and you know, which, which style is superior. It's the old uh, Taekwondo versus Jiu Jitsu kind of argument. It's, it's, a, it's a fun argument to have, but not as useful as the ways that they're similar. I think that's much more, much more fun and much more interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the uh, structure and manufacture of the hilt certainly helps us differentiate between the types of weapons. Um, a messer, this is typical for a messer, is set up generally like a large knife. It is riveted together similar to the way knife scales would be put on the tang of a knife blade. Mm -hmm. And a storta, this one is unfinished, un currently unmounted, but has a tang that is designed for the entire hilt to fit on one piece at a time and to be riveted together from the back, much like the swords of the day. I actually a, have a very okay. interesting comment from one of our viewers right at the moment. Actually. Oh, good. Please. Um, they actually stated that um, storta is the same linguistic root as distorted. It's most likely meaning skewed or curved. It's a term referring 
to its being distorted, distinct from the straight or symmetrical sword. So that's very Fantastic. interesting. Thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah, when, when I looked up storta, I found uh, wrenching was one of the words that was used in, in conjunction with that a lot. So uh, a wrenching and then twisting. Uh, so yeah, twisting in the, in the actual description of the blade, that totally makes sense. That's, that's fantastic. So, all right, getting back on track, um, I, we were talking about the differences between the Messer, German Messer, and the Storta. Um, and it's right. also important to keep in mind um, that we like to classify, modern, modern people like to classify our swords into, yeah. this is what this is, this is what this is, this is what this is, and we like our categories right. very right. clear. Um, they didn't do it back then, so, a sword was a sword. So right. keep right. that in mind. Um, we like to classify things nice and clean that those, but there's a lot of blurred lines in what we look at. So absolutely. It's, it's something that uh, you, you can, you can look back through the way that collectors and uh, Victorian historians would, would look at pieces and what they would call something changes. And, and the more you actually study the original source material, the better off you are, um, the closer you get to the root of what uh, the actual weapon would have been called in the day, if it was called anything. If you just went into a shop and said, I want a single edged blade um, because you know it's gonna be my self-defense sword and I'm not taking it to war. So I'm not worried about running into anyone with armor. It's gonna be sort of like the, uh, the ubiquitous Bowie knife on the American plains. It's gonna be a self-defense weapon against potentially unarmored brigands. Uh, it could be a hunting weapon. Often they're called hunting swords in, in collections. And so there's a lot of blurred lines between is, is this a hunting sword? Is it a messer? Is it a storta? What country did it come from? Germany or Italy aren't concepts that they really had then. So what region is, is it from? What, what sort of trade route? What inspired it? depends on who made it, you know, and, and all of that. And so it, it's, it's quite a lot of fun to look at the, uh, the sort of curvy lines that are, that are sort of typical with the Storta. Um, a lot of them are pictured in, in Renaissance art with angels as well. So it's, it's sometimes featured with the archangel Michael. I think he occasionally has a flaming curved Storta to make him look more exotic and more interesting. And, when metallurgy starts to be more uh, advanced and the kinds of grinding that you can do get more advanced and, and more ornate work is possible, you start to see the imagination of the blade maker in the pieces that, that he's making. Um, Storta are an example of a really high level bladesmithing. They have a really good time with bevels. They have a really good time making false edges and clip points and things like that. Um, got a, an example of a blade over here that I've been working on for a while that sort of falls into that into that category. Um, so it's got a, a, a pretty deep false edge, but also some bevels. My camera can catch the detail some bevels that are not sharp at all. There we go. Yeah, there we go. Um, that is, it's just an opportunity to show off the, uh, the blade maker's skill. Um, they were often fullered very intricately. And um, we look at, let's see, which the, one of the first Storta that I saw in a museum, we've got uh, uh, photo number one here was the first picture of a Storta that I really looked at in great detail. And my goodness, what, what kind of sword is this? What, it's, it's not a messer, which was my first thought. Oh, it's a, it's a Grossa messer. No, it's, it's not. And you can look at that really intricate uh, work on that grip. There are more detailed close-up pictures of that available on the internet. And I, I saw a fantastic reproduction of that exact sword. Um, I'm really sad that I didn't write down uh, the, the company or the, the person that made 
the the replica because it was just fantastic work. It was a a beautiful copy of that exact weapon with the gilding. And if you can find an image of that particular Storta, there's a inscription chiseled and engraved down the back of the blade that's been gilded as well. You can see that in the picture the closer you look at it. So I really feel that one of the ways that you can differentiate the Messer from the Storta is that from the beginning, the Storta seems to me to have to have always been kind of fancy. Whereas the Messer, you can find fancy examples of a Messer. The later in time you get, the further into the 16th century, um, Grosse Messer, uh, Swiss Sabres do become fairly ornate, but they don't start out that way. The, the Messer is a utilitarian piece, much like a, uh, a Frontier Bowie. I made kind of a rough example of a, of a Bowie knife years ago. That it, it's, it's something that can be done without the major manufacturing potential that was required to make something more like the Storta. Um, with all of those intricate fullers and complex guards. The, uh, the Italian arms race, let's say, the, the Italian uh, um, mass production of weaponry, put them in a place where they could, they could mass produce a high level of quality on the types of swords and, and weaponry that they could make. They could outfit um, fairly large armies in a relatively short period of time. If you wanted to outfit uh, an entire 10,000 man army, you would go to some of the, the centers of weapon making in Italy. And that's where you would get your, your armor. So essentially, um, your banners and everything. So go essentially Italy, Italy at this point in time was really kind of the major industrial military complex of the medieval period. Absolutely. Was, and the Renaissance Absolutely. period as well. And while you had other areas that were also manufacturing weapons and arms, such as uh, Solikin, Mora, um, Toledo, these other areas as well, really Italy is where things were really based um, in a position to really take the most advantage of things because of their location in the Mediterranean, um, their mm -hmm. access to the trade routes both from the east and from the west. Um, and of access course, to materials is, is their a, history yeah, overall from the Roman Empire, even with the fall of the Roman Empire, you had advantages from that history, allowing them to really have that kind of industrial base for weaponry moving on from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That uh, gives you the opportunity to really see um, some of the uh, the weapon making art, the, the cutlery art of, of some of this. Um, like. Uh, pictures number two and 11 um i've i've been inspired by and have used their velvet scabbards as an inspiration to uh to make a few velvet covered scabbards of my own so when i'm working on um some pieces that i that i know i want to be a higher level even in the scabbard i'll use a uh, a velvet uh, as the scabbard. And this is going to get a fairly ornate open shape. Metalwork is going to come up to about here, and then there'll be some bands around it um, and, and a, a throat up at the top as well. So you're pretty much only limited by your imagination, especially as you look at, at some of the, the artwork of the day. The Storta is so often associated with extravagance and finery that uh, it, it just becomes uh, an opportunity to play around with the, the style and the genre and to really, um, really have fun with it. There's some opportunities for fun file work on the hilts and, and fairly strange avant-garde shapes. And one thing I really want to highlight um, about the difference between the Storta and other blades is really two things between it's kind of its sister weapons as you so if you want to call them that the falchion for one like you mentioned earlier had a lot more weight in for uh towards the tip of the blade and i mean mm -hmm. it was kind of like a sharpened mace in some ways is if you couldn't cut your target you broke your target so breaking bones mm -hmm. 
break mm-hmm. the bones in the hands and the arms, if you could crush the collarbone, all of these things are debilitating hits um, in combat. When you get into the plate armor in the Renaissance in the late medieval period, that's no longer really effective against that. Um, mm-hmm. So unlike the falchion, the storta is a more balanced blade, kind of like the uh, Grosse Messer or the Kriegmesser, de- um, depending right. upon the size of the blade. The difference between the German Messer and the Storta is actually in the uh, grip itself. So the <laughs> Messer's grip is actually a full tang, for the most part, that is pinned into place, whereas the Stortas are typically more the traditional through tang of swords, um, kind of like the long sword um, right. and o- other similar blades like that. Right. The uh, the the fun some of the fun examples that I've that I've come across uh, images I believe three and four are are examples of the nautilus shell pommel. Um, so you you see that it's set up like just a regular old fashioned sword, but they've really had a good time decorating and, and working with their um, with their forging work um, to create more ergonomic shapes and and shapes that look as though they sort of grew in place rather than were uh like a standard sort of a geometric sword um something that's you know a a, a typical european long sword in in format uh like this you take and and get to have fun with it and really create something asymmetrical and uh, ergonomic um yeah, I believe uh, uh, image five and six, uh, three, four, five, and six are some really fun examples of uh, hilt work. Now, some of these, it, it's possible, as I've looked at this one a little more closely, um, it's possible that this one might be uh, a Victorian fake. Some of the blacksmithing has me ask, asking questions about, uh, about the reality of that piece. But it's so fun. It's such a really interesting example of the type. I included it in here because it's, I, I think it deserves to be included. But that one, that one may not actually belong in a real museum. That one might be, uh, that should possibly be a collector's piece for, for what it represents rather than being an actual, uh, an actual Renaissance sword. And then moving um, on to the last one. Here we go. Yeah, this one's really fun. It's, uh, I've seen very similar hilt shapes on long swords as well that occasionally will have a uh, a, a fantastical bird head um, I think there's a close up of that bird's head where you can actually see that the tongue is uh, a separate piece that's attached into the pommel and uh, I've seen some that are brass so the pommel is steel and occasionally uh, looks like it's been blackened or blued Potentially, it may have been gilded or something like that at one point. And the, the tongue articulates inside the mouth of whatever animal is forming the pommel. So that's just a really, really fun, uh, creative, artistic uh, example of, of a store to hilt. Um, they were a little bit on the nose with some of their designs as well. They, they acknowledge that this is a copy by word of mouth of a Moorish or Turkish type of weapon. And so uh, I've got a couple of examples on uh, number seven and number eight of boar's head pommels. That's a fairly popular artistic and decorative theme for Storta and, and many other swords of this time period. It helps with the, the, uh, the idea that Italy was this sort of melting pot of, of cultures running into each other and trade and, and all of that. And so how to be more exotic than to actually decorate your hilt with the, the head, the, the pommel is the head of, of the enemy that you might be going to fight in, in a, some crusade or another, or to, you know, think about taking Jerusalem back again and again and again. And we've got some more interesting comments from one of our uh, watchers. Um, Elmsley, my apologies if I don't say that correctly, but thank you for commenting. 
Um, he's saying that the falchion is not a crushing weapon. Um, the, the, the surviving examples that they, uh, he's had the They're opportunity to sharp. actually um, uh, examine himself are extremely lightweight weapons optimized for cutting. Um, and, but then also does say that um, there is a design shift later on in the second quarter of the 16th century, and you do get them becoming heavier from that point, saying it's all relative, of course. Um, right. Thank you for commenting again. Um, yeah. Um, I, I think, yeah, the, the looking at the, the format of the earlier falchions, describing them as a shearing, a shearing weapon. It allows you to put the same amount of mass as a regular sword blade into that long, single-edged cutting weapon. It's going to concentrate a lot of force into the cut. That doesn't mean that it's forward-weighted or imbalanced at all. Uh, but the format of what makes a Storta different from what we think of as a falchion is typified by that forward weight of the design, where the blade of a falchion widens generally and has a lot of the weight out dispersed toward the front for cutting. Um, the Storta has a slightly different look and, and feel to it and makes them, to me, have that fun Renaissance look rather than, uh, even if the weight, even if they would feel very similar, um, the appearance of the, of the weapon is, is different. And that's uh, that's the fun thing about how that weight distributes, mm -hmm. even so, if it's not heavy or imbalanced at all for crushing, of course. <laughs> so um, we've talked quite a bit about what the Storta is in comparison to other blades and kind of the characteristics of that. So when exactly do we start really seeing this blade actually start to come into play? And what's really kind of the use and the impetus driving its development? I, th I, I don't have an exact date for when they start really becoming popular, but they start to show up a lot in that in the sort of the Renaissance art. Renaissance is such a broad term, it covers a lot of that uh, 13th, 14th, 15th century. The Renaissance is happening as Italy expands and exposes itself to, to a lot more cultures and a lot more trade. So I, I would say that you see, if I would call it the height, of the uh, the Storta, I would say would be 1480s to 1600s. You see some that are set up, um, I believe images 9 and 10, have more complex hilts that would be perfectly at home alongside any rapier. These are later period and in a lot of collections for a lot of years, a piece like 9 and 10 would be considered a cutlass. It's probably how it would have been uh, labeled in a lot of collections for a long time. And so is it a cutlass? Was it potentially used in, in naval engagements? Perhaps. But um, that sort of became a blanket term for any wide single-edged blade. You would say, yeah, it's very useful in a naval setting because you're not dealing with quite the level of armor that you are in land engagements. So you're more likely to be fighting a, a less armored opponent. And that wide shearing blade makes a lot of sense when dealing in ship to ship combat. If you do have to cut ropes and rigging and things like that, um, imagining, you know, someone in half armor or a three quarter cuirass, even with some sort of buckler or, or shield on their left arm, wielding a wide single edged blade, um, could just wreak havoc in lightly armored sailors who, who would very likely not have a lot of armor to their name. So it, it would be a, a, a classic Marines weapon, uh, wide cutting, but certainly really good at, at creating devastating stabbing wounds um, type of weapon. So useful on, on board ship, useful on foot, uh, Useful in mounted combat if it's long enough to hit somebody standing on the ground as you ride by. So, would this also kind of fit the same role as the uh, Messer as well? Kind of just the everyday kind of carry sword, kind of the... Probably. Um, they don't seem... I, there are certainly like rough, simple, less ornate, and less decorative examples, but the 
the fun um, to me is that so many Storta seem to be, obviously the ones that have been kept in museums and the ones that we see in paintings are highly decorated and, and ornate and gilded. And so it seems from the beginning to me to have not been the same kind of weapon as a messer. A messer is a, a practical weapon that can be made um, more simply and tends to be much more simple in its manufacture and construction. You certainly see Maximilian and, and people like, like that have fine examples of messers and uh, um, really, really fasc fascinating hunting swords that are decorated ornately. But that's not the typical messer. The typical Storta is kind of fancy. They don't seem to be, and this could be an example of the reason that, you know, Italy has a, a booming economy and a lot of, a lot of trade and all the stuff that we've talked about before. So it's the fancy version of the single edged cutting sword that shows up, you know, pretty much across Europe, but um, it, it sort of gets fine tuned and imaginative and artistic in, in the Italian imagination. And, and that's, uh, that's one of the things that I really like about it. So I guess one possibility is that instead of being more of a general use blade like the Messer really was, um, could it have potentially been more of a status symbol, kind of the aristocrat's sword um, that mm -hmm. really denoted status during this period of time? Right. There's a, there's a fantastic example. Um, Cosimo Medici has a really fantastic falchion is what it's been called for many many years the medici falchion um and and there are a few people making replicas of that um and it's a it's a fascinating piece it's got some really nice fullering it looks at first glance like it might be a little unwieldy and bulky but then you start to see how much weight that fullering removes and i'm sure that it handles very nicely it's short but it looks imposing and I believe that's, uh, we've got image number 12 is uh, an image of the Medici falchion. And uh, I don't know which um, museum has this piece, but a sword like that um, wielded by, you know, a well-trained young fit nobleman um, would have been just a devastating weapon. And if he spends most of his time walking the streets from place to place, a weapon like that is going to be a very effective deterrent for street crime and street violence. Um, much like you have the, uh, the characters in another, you know, 50 or 60 years, maybe less, start all walking around with rapiers. Um, it, it is the, the more, to me, in, in not necessarily just the way it's illustrated, but it seems like it would be the, the civilian sidearm for a military man or a, or a nobleman of worth to walk the streets with or ride about the countryside and have this uh, example of his wealth right on his hip. Um, but it, it's a very practical, useful, extra long Bowie knife that he can use to wreak havoc on, on anyone who uh, comes after him. Mm -hmm. And I was just informed that the Medici Falchion is actually from the Wallace Collection in London. You can mm -hmm. check it out there. Um, and then the, I thought the, um, the idea of survivor bias was also brought up. I was actually going to ask about this as well. So we have a lot of um, the finer examples that have survived uh, probably because they were treated better because obviously they're more ornate yeah, examples. Absolutely. So there is the possibility that a lot of the more hard used everyday swords didn't mm -hmm. survive and sure. they could have been sure. everywhere. But then the argument against that also is that we do have a decent number of surviving messers. So if they were right. in the same right. situation, why is there a higher number of messers? that still exists today as opposed to the number of stortas. I don't right, have an answer right. for that. There's arguments to be made both ways and something mm -hmm. to keep in mind. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We, we see a lot of um, Messer in art and, and Storta in art. They, they show up in, in a lot of uh, artistic depictions. And when the vast amount of surviving examples that, that we do have that I know of, that I've seen uh, images of, 
tend to match the level of decoration of the art of the paintings that leads me to think that that's the type of weapon that it was of course i'm i'm sure that you know again a uh, a mid a mid level marine boarding a galley um is probably going to want himself a nice wide sturdy cutting blade and uh he doesn't care how decorated it is hilt might be blued to keep some of the salt water off whatever right mm-hmm. i'm sure there were plenty of business like uh storta that we will that we will never see that that unfortunately never made their way into museum collections or uh or the paintings of the day but so many of the examples that we do see and that we do have are whimsical and uh, imaginative that that's what makes it uh, a favorite of mine and the other thing to keep in mind is that ornamentation is extremely common on italian weapons um, mm-hmm. I mean, even going back again to ancient Rome, the next video for everybody's no, uh, information will be on the Roman gladius, actually. I'm finishing up the research on that. But even then, you're seeing a lot of ornamentation on weapons. So even during mm-hmm. the Roman days, um, when you would think that there wouldn't be, everything would be kind of very primitive and straightforward and stuff, and that's not the case. Even for foot yeah. soldiers, you're seeing a lot of gilded inlay of silver and other um, precious materials that are being used right, in these. Right. When uh, you look at a, a table full of M4s or uh, you know, AR-15s, whatever, you can start to pick out individual features. But uh, a bunch of issued weapons that are all exactly the same have never really interested fighting people, fighting men, tend to customize a piece or make it their own or my foregrip is a little closer than yours and and that's the way i that's the way i run it my sword blade is a half an inch longer than yours and the weight is a little bit further back in my hand and i've uh, i've made sure that my scabbard has some gold and inlay and and personalized it to the soldier to the individual um i, I think that's that's a common instinct among this type of this type of warrior, um, and then you've got people that would give these weapons as gifts, and so of course the gift has a huge value if it's also literally made of gold, and there's gilding on the blade, and there's just fantastic chisel work and little angels and demons carved into the pommel, or a Moor's head, for example, things like that that are uh, artistic and uh, evocative. This piece is symbolic of skill and worth and so the the individual warrior wanting a custom personalized weapon totally makes sense even when they're all mass issued which doesn't happen happen a lot throughout history and of course a lot more recently than than in the uh the medieval or the renaissance period mm-hmm. okay um do you have any last thoughts, Benaya, before we turn things over to the audience for some questions? And for members of the audience, if you have some questions, go ahead and leave them in the chat so that we can get to those. No, um, I, I don't. Um, I, I am, as, as uh, James mentioned at the beginning, I'm a cutler. Um, I had the, probably should have started with this. I had the great privilege of uh, training with Dennis Graves, um, from Colorado for many years, uh, spent a lot of time in his shop about 15 years or so. And it was just a, uh, a wonderful experience learning how to fit hilts to blades. I've recently done a lot more of my own blade grinding. Um, whereas, you know, for the first 10 years or so, I, I just fitted things and, and mounted blades that were made by someone else. But I have had so much fun making these these sort of blades that I just uh, I just can't quit and I want to make a lot more so these are super fun giving me an opportunity to explore um, my my skill with a grinder and and get better at it so I I want to make a lot more storta it's my it's my favorite thing right now <laughs> excellent so um, I'll give a couple of notifications if last chance going for your to ask a question in the chat um 
Benaiah was actually the one who will have uh, furbished and actually worked on the Gladius that will be presented in the next video. So that is his work. Keep an eye out for that video. Uh, it should be very interesting. Um, and then check out his stuff. I will have, I will make sure that we get contact information in the description of this video for him so that if you're interested in uh, any of his work, um, commissioning a piece, or even just talking about his work, you'll be able to get in touch with him. Um, furthermore, hopefully there will be, um, I will be able to bring experts on to this channel about every month. So start looking out for live streams like this um, a lot more often. And hopefully we'll be able to bring in a lot of people and give you a lot of insight to topics that a lot of people haven't had the chance, opportunity to really learn about in the knife world. So. Double check, doesn't look like there's any final questions. So thank you everybody for tuning in. Thank you especially to everybody who commented uh, in the chat and gave us a little bit more to talk about. I appreciate it. So until next time, thank you very much. Stay safe and keep living the knife life. Have a good one.